it's a new episode of We Are 757 The Show. This is the Stay Home Edition. Had to uh, holler at my guy, Jack Heron. What's up, bro? Not much, man. How you been? I'm all right, man. How does uh, Corona treating you? Uh, well, right now I'm healthy, which is the most important thing, but... Uh-huh. You know, I am. Uh, I'm. I'm going a little stir crazy up in my one bedroom apartment here. <laughs> um, you know, uh, just waiting for basketball to get back, man. Can't wait. But as of right now, just trying to stay on top of things. You think it's ever gonna get back? I mean, eventually. I don't think we're really gonna have. I don't think AAU is gonna happen this year, and I'm even leaning toward. I don't believe kids are gonna go back to school at the right time. So, uh, you know, we. I think we'll have to wait, but obviously we're going to get back to basketball at some point. So, Do you think, even though, like, the season, like, basketball season was almost over in the 7-5, do you think, like, it's going to hurt the 2020 kids? Because I feel like it's hurting them, especially with the yeah, transfer absolutely. Board. I mean, I think even, even the cancellation of the state championship games outside of the Class 2 uh, state championship game, there's a lot, of, a lot of colleges who are done with their season at that point. Mm -hmm. um, especially the D2 and D3 schools, all come to the state championships at VCU. So I think a lot of kids, you know, the, the, the 10 teams that didn't get to play missed an opportunity to play in front of college coaches. Um, I think that this time of year, I mean, with, with the April live period, there's a lot of stuff where people are trying to fill out their rosters for the next year. And, uh, you know, so I think a lot of the available kids aren't getting their last opportunity to play in front of coaches. And it's the opportunity where they get the the best chance of being, you know, able to impress a coach who really needs somebody. So I think, uh, you know, it, it kind of affected everybody. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Even, like, all-star games and everything was canceled. I'm like, this yeah. is yeah. I mean, I mean, it's one of those – I was laughing with a coach. I was like, 10 years ago, the only way that you really got seen by coaches is to make that all-star game. And uh, it's still that way. Once the all-star game happens, it's – a lot of schools that need somebody and or they're finishing up recruiting somebody. So they want to show up and say, you know, I was here to watch you in your final game. And, you know, there's, there's no opportunity for that right now. So I think it's hurting a lot of kids. I think it's hurting kids of all classes. I think it's hurting coaches. Um, you know, I think it's, it's tough for everybody because not only are they not able to go see you, kids aren't able to go on visits right now. Yeah. So kids who are going to have to uh, commit are basically doing it on virtual tours or, um, you know, without visiting at all. So I think that it's going to affect, you know, we're seeing a high transfer right now. I think it's going to even be more next year because all these kids are committing without actually going to the school itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I talked to one of your counterparts, uh, Zach, uh, the other time. And he uh, Last episode, he was saying that uh, the transfer portal is even crazy right now. Because, like, a lot of the college kids are even getting the opportunity to, like, stay back or switch schools without penalty or something like that. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, they're in the talk right now of doing the uh, – of getting rid of the one-year transfer. Um, but from everything that I've talked to, everyone I've talked to, they, they think that that's going to happen next year, which I think will be partially because of what's going on right now. Um, but, you know, so everybody right now is having to do – you know, we've got – upwards of 600, 700 kids in the transfer portal right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not all those kids are going to be able to go to the same level. A lot of them think they're going to go higher. A lot of people are going to have to go lower. Um, you know, but I think that that in itself is also hurting the 2020 kids because you're getting, um, you know, every coach that calls me is, hey, do you know any transfers? Do you know any transfers? I know the same transfer <laughs> y'all have. You know what I mean? I, I've, I've followed the, the transfer portal and see a lot of kids that I know that are in it. Um, but you know, it's, I think it's hurting the, the kids who are right on the border of possibly getting a full scholarship because coaches are willing to take somebody who's been, uh, in the college grind before, instead of taking a, a chance on a young kid who's got to come in and learn it all and, uh, get used to classes and even the academic parts of things are getting a little messed up. Kids who haven't taken the SAT, I heard the SAT may not matter this year right. uh, because there's so many kids that are missing out on that. So uh, they're just going to go strict, strictly on your, like, GPA? Yeah, which I think will hurt a lot of kids who maybe, you know, messed up a lot when they were younger, mm -hmm. and then they could still get a good test score and be able to get into certain schools. I think that um, it's, you know, kind of a it's, – it's a situation we've never been in, so we don't really know what to expect from it. 
Yeah. So I think that a lot of, you know, with kids being already in school, as long as you didn't flunk out, you can pretty much transfer uh, wherever you want uh, versus kids who maybe are right on the border of being eligible. Any other year they can maybe get a good SAT score and get eligible. But right now we got kids who are on that two 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 three right on the border of the clearinghouse um, that aren't going to be able to finish their last semester. Yeah. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see um, how this not only affects this year, but even moving forward for the next few years, um, how, how the academics of everything will affect. Yeah, that's, that's, that's sad and it's good. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's a very different, crazy situation. Um, who, who would you uh, – I know you do a lot of your – you still do a lot of work in 804 since you lived there. Like, who would you most impressed by with this year, high school season? Uh, in the 757 or, or – I mean, uh, it don't matter. 804, 757. Um, you know, I think from the 757, um, you know, I got out there probably six or seven times this year. Um, I mean, this is no shocker. One of the kids that really impressed me this year was Jaden Epps. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that, you know, I thought Jaden played in front of a lot of hostile crowds. Um, it seemed to me that that uh, Kings Fork team kind of took on the um, the kind of villain role of the seven five seven. They played. They played in every event. They played in, you know, at their place and on the road. Every game they went to was sold out. And um, you know, Jaden seemed to really kind of kind of thrive in it. I know that he had some situations. Um, with, with some, some crowds and things like that. But, uh, you know, I was really impressed at his ability to just kind of step up at his age mm -hmm. in front of a bunch of people who, uh, you know, are hoping to see him fail. And I, I thought he played really, really well this year. Um, I know he led the area in scoring. Him and Justin Fatherly led the area in scoring. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that it's uh, – I think that he's going to be a real special one to watch moving forward. Uh, and I think that if that Kings Fork team can stay together, they've got a chance of winning – multiple state championships um some other kids that really impressed me um this year i would say i really like butter from um western branch western branch yeah uh you know he moved into our top 10 i just released my 2022 rankings recently he moved up into our top 10 um this year i think he did a lot more on the basketball showed that he can um create as well as score with the ball in his hands uh -huh. um and he just seems to kind of be getting better every single time i see him play um, Donald Han Jr. was another one in the 22 class that really stepped up. I mean, he grew to 6'4". He looks like he's still growing. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that he's got – he's still got room to get better, I think, um, as a true point guard. But as far as his ability to shoot the basketball at his size and put it on the deck, uh, I think college coaches are going to absolutely love him. As far as, like, some of the other kids, uh, Jelani Darden was great down the stretch for um, Norview. Uh, I found it really funny when they, they came up and played Henrico in the state quarterfinals and they had blown a little bit of a lead. Uh, you know, Henrico had cut it to about six with like a minute and a half left. And as he's coming back on the court, they're uh, playing the cha-cha slide and he's doing the dance moves <laughs> as, as if it's not a, a close game in the middle of, you know, the state tournament, but that's just kind of his demeanor. He's like a goofy yeah. kid and, you know, I think he has a lot of confidence in himself where he can do the cha-cha slide and then put the dagger in you, which he did. Yeah. So, you know, he, he's, a, he's somebody that I think is really good to watch. And I think that there's tons of available kids for, for all levels in the 2020 class. Um, John Hines, Justin Fatherly, Khalil Davis. Um, I was so surprised with Khalil Davis. So happy for him, man, especially with Wilson being – not. I'm, gonna say, I'm not going to say they were bad last year, but – they won't win it. You know what I'm saying? And they had pretty good players on their team. But yeah. this year, they, like, stepped up tremendously. Yeah, I mean, I think it's something where it's like you almost forget about Wilson at times because even back when we were playing, they weren't really very good. They've never been a super good program, at least on the boys' side. Their girls have always been pretty good. But, you know, you could steadily watch them get better each year. Um, him and James Prescott have kind of laid the foundation uh, – um, you know, so I think that they surprised people with their run this year. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, I, I think a lot of people saw that saw them over the summer and in the fall and saw them yeah. kind of get better and better each time, knew that they were uh, they were going to be a really good team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I heard they – I went to the game when they played at ODU team camp, 
and they beat and they beat Kingsport. Mm-hmm. And then they played uh, Kingsport. It was in somewhere else in the summer league, and they said they beat them as well. But then it was like the only time that Kingsport actually beat them was if they played at Kingsport. Mm-hmm. So that's why they definitely wanted to get that rematch in the state championship. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel I feel bad for all the kids in the uh, state championship situation. But I remember I put a tweet out about it. As much as everybody wanted to play in that game, you know, in ten. 10- 15 years when you're telling your cousins and kids and stuff like that, you're never going to call yourself a co-champion. You know, every one of those kids earn the right to call themselves state champions. Every time I've wrote about any of those kids, I've never used the term co-state champion. They all are, you know, have earned the right to be state champions. And as much as they wanted to play in that game, I think they'll look back on this season and, and, and be happy with what happened. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, how, what, what do you think about five, what are the five state championships? From the seven five seven, well, well, how you like that statistic? What is eight oh four doing? Uh, you know, <laughs> eight oh four was uh, they they were a little down this year. Um, a lot of very young talent. Verina and Elsie Burr were both two teams. They they were two of the top three teams in the class five region out of here with Henrico. Henrico had four senior starters. Verina and Elsie Burr combined had one. They had um, a lot of – there were a lot of teams that were, like, junior, sophomore-laden teams um, that I think will will bounce back and be in the conversation the next few years. But this is definitely the year of the 757. I mean, they it's, – it's been that situation where they've had to kind of um, prove themselves, I think, a little bit because outside of, like, six and four with a couple of them, um, you know, ever since – Norcom kind of hasn't been where they've been, uh, you know, after winning four straight. Uh, I think that this is a great year for them. And I think that you're looking at a couple teams in, um, you know, class six, class four, Lansdowne, Western Branch, um, Kings Fork. Uh, I, all these schools are going to be schools that have a chance to um, make another run next year yeah. with, with that coming back. I mean, Western Branch pretty much brings back everybody. Mm-hmm. Kings Fork pretty much brings back everybody. Uh, so I think that they're going to be in there. And then I think you throw Cape Henry in there for the private school section. Uh, you know, they bring back literally everybody except for a couple of their bench players. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I think they'll add one or two more pieces. And I think that, that Cape Henry is going to be in the, in the, the talks with the, you know, WCAC schools and, and the Trinity Episcopals and stuff like that next year when it comes to uh, a state tournament run as well. So I think it's, it's, you know, they always say that the talent goes in waves, and I think that this is one of those times when, when the 7-5 is, is up there as, you know, the possibly the best area for basketball in the, in the state right now. Yeah, yeah. I was really impressed with uh, Green Run. I didn't get to see them a lot last year. And uh, I feel like Jake Cooper has definitely been, like, leading that team, like, so well. It, he always looks, like, composed, like nothing bothers him. And I don't know, he just felt like a great leader. And then with the loss to A.J. James, I just felt like that was just a special moment for them uh, to get to that state championship game. Yeah, I mean, as as just as, as heartbreaking a moment as that was, um, I mean, you see it in sports all the time where people rally around tragedy. And when, when that happened and, and the situation in which it happened, um, I felt like it was impossible to really pick against Green Run. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not only do they have the talent, the depth, the lead guard, like you said, Jay Cooper was fantastic all year. He, um, he deserved all the accolades that he got, um, including state player of the year. But, you know, I think that with all that going on, I mean, they, they, it just added more motivation for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and an area that they didn't really need motivation, but once, you know, that all happened and how close everybody was to AJ and how great of a kid he was, um, you know, I think that it just, it was like one of those storybook endings that that you just knew was going to happen, mm-hmm. you know. And and so I'm I'm extremely happy for them and Coach Harris and all those kids. They worked really hard, um, and you know, to be able to to bring it back for him, I thought was great. It sucks that they didn't get to play in that game, but uh, you know, I think that there, there's no better ending to a season than that. And I mean. You know, I'm sure that we all – like, they all miss Ashley just like we do. Um, and, you know, he was going on to have a great career and, and was, was doing big things over at Hargrave. And, um, you know, he, he left a lasting impression on not just that part of the state, but I think anybody who covers basketball in this area. So, yeah. for them to be able to win it for him, I thought was great. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know who I was impressed with this year? This uh, your alumni school, especially with D Nice back over there. Uh, Kemsville, bro, they are coming up, especially with uh, Dom and uh, Elijah. And then they got a lot of role players that do well, do really good. Have you uh, got a chance to see them this year? Yeah, I got to see them. They came out to Richmond for the um, the Above the Rim Classic that had um, Sierra Canyon come down and play John Marshall. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think that uh, there's there's nobody that I would rather take. You know, it, it was a couple people that were involved in uh in in the head coach search. One of them may or may not have been my kin. Um, but if it wasn't going to be him, um, you know, there's nobody I would rather want to have that job than D-Nice. I actually played AAU for D-Nice back in the day in middle school and things like that, um, you know, and I think that he's in a great situation where he can help develop some of these young kids. I think that the uh, jump that Dom Stanford took this year was as impressive as anybody's. Uh, you know, he's looking like a legitimate mid-major, possibly more with an extra year type player he's got great size he can score from multiple levels he's a good athlete um pretty good feel and i think elijah is uh is is really grooming it d nice is really grooming him into being a floor general um you really saw the ability in him as a freshman but now you start to see the poise he's playing with um the leadership that he's he's shown um i think that they're just going to continue to get better and better and uh you know, if they can stay in the gym and and stay working, I think that they're a team that could surprise a couple people in the beach district. I think they surprised plenty this year, yeah. but I think that next year, I mean, you're looking at possibly two of the best players in the beach um, on a Kemsville team that hasn't had something like that since, you know, back when I was that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I, I really am liking the way that it's uh, that it's going for them, so – I think that uh, Dom's going to have a lot of college coaches in, in the gym for him next year. Mm -hmm. So who is uh, some of the uh, uh, players that y'all picked for the top? Because I know y'all do your own top 757 or top players in the state. How does that work? Or who do – what's more, I guess, relevant or that people care about? Because I know the pilot does something and then a lot of other – brands do something as well i mean i i don't think that there's any argument that the ones that people see the most and um care the most about are the local ones so you look at out here we've got the all met from the richmond times dispatch over there you guys have the all 757 with the virginia pilot um those are probably the biggest ones now where you get into um some problems with that, I think, is that people who are in the pilot aren't 100% basketball-centric like we are. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at guys who probably have to lean a lot on what coaches say, probably have to lean a lot on what other people say. Um, and sure, they know some of, some of the basketball and, and, and the big names and things like that, but uh, I don't think that they quite see as much as we do because they're not – covering basketball every single day. They're not writing about basketball every single day. They've got to cover swimming and they've got to cover wrestling and they've got to cover, um, you know, everything else that, that goes into it where we're just a hundred percent basketball centric people. Yeah. So I think that it's, it's kind of twofold. I don't know if they're the most um, reputable. I don't think, I'm not sure that they are the most, um, I guess you would say correct. And what they do, but when it's all said and done, the local paper is always going to have the um, the biggest buzz surrounding it for that because yeah, it's local people putting out their local teams. Um, as far as we did, I mean, we got a lot, a lot of of feedback that wasn't great, depending on like based on our all state teams. But what we did, we try to be so different with our our content. So we did our all state teams by year. And Zach did his all 757 teams by year. So we did a senior team, we did a junior team, a sophomore, and a freshman team. Yeah. Uh, and while we try to do it with all state is we tried to make it like, like you were making a basketball team. So five guys made the first team, second yeah. team, and third team. And we tried to do it by position. So we wanted two guards, we wanted two forwards, and we wanted a big. Okay. So a lot of kids probably got snubbed on that because – 
we already had four point guards and we couldn't put a fifth one in on three teams. I got you. you know? So I think that, um, you know, I'm not going to say ours is 100% accurate, but in the way that we did it, we did it the best way we can. And obviously kids are always going to get left off. Kids who deserve it are going to get left off. It's just how it works when you do something like that. Just like when I do my rankings. There are plenty of kids. There's over thousands and thousands of kids play basketball in Virginia. I can't fit all of them into 150 prospect rankings. So there's always kids who deserve it that are going to get left out. It's not our intention to leave them out, but it's just what happens. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be, you know, such an honor to be on it if everybody was on it. Yeah. So what, what, what do you think? I, I know uh, Kanye was left off the one in the pilot. What do you think about that? Uh, I, think I think that that one was maybe overlooked by them. I don't know if they maybe didn't talk to Kof about it. I mean, we weren't able to fit Kanye in our all-state teams, but that included all the entire state of Virginia and not just the 757. Yeah. When I talked to, to Kof and saw the numbers he put up, and how he's helped turn Princess Anne around, I thought that he definitely deserved to be on there. With that being said, there's so much guard talent in that area that it's easy to forget about somebody like Kanye or even somebody like Kenyon Giles or yeah. Deke Campbell, guys like that. There are going to be people who forget about them because there's just – how do you remember all of them? So, you know, I thought that he definitely deserved to be on there. Um, but – I mean, I can't speak for them. I would probably say that they overlooked him a little bit. Yeah. Maybe had some other names and, and forgot about Kanye or just didn't do their research. But uh, I definitely would say that he probably deserved to be on there. Do you think uh, Twitter plays a big part in, uh, like, the basketball community? Because, I mean, it get crazy up there sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they um, – I mean, Twitter is – we talked about this last time I was on your show. Social media has done so much good for basketball. It helps kids be able to put out their highlights. It helps coaches be able to contact you. It helps um, guys like me and you put our content out there so different people can see them, including coaches and other media members and things like that. Um, but what do, you, what do you say about a kid who doesn't constantly um, promote themselves on Twitter? Does that diminish what they do on the basketball court? Absolutely not. No. So I think that it's up to us to do our research and make sure that we're staying on top of kids that maybe just because they don't have a million highlights on Twitter, they're not contacting us every day because nothing annoys me more than the kid who just sits there and begs over and over again for me to write stuff about him and do things like that. But at the same time, um, you know, if it, it, especially when I go into these little areas, if there's nothing on Twitter for me to be able to reach out and find people or stuff like that, it can get difficult at times. But, again, that's part of our job, to be able to research it and find all that. Um, and for everything good that happens on Twitter, we also have all the ridiculous Twitter beefs that go on. <laughs> different coaches and different handlers and different media members. And, you know, it, it more makes me laugh than anything. I, I, I sometimes get involved just, just to entertain myself, especially during this uh, quarantine here. But, huh? you know, I think that at times um, – it, it can have a negative effect in the fact that a lot of people are out chasing their own clout. So we have people who everybody on Twitter basically has the same platform. So whether or not the person knows what they're talking about, whether or not um, the people utilize it correctly, the people who do utilize it correctly are always going to get seen more. So I think that it's something that it, it can help. It can hurt, but it definitely has, it's firmly in the basketball atmosphere right now. It, it's something that we all use and we all look into. So I, I would say to answer your question, yes, it, it has a big, big uh, – it's a big deal right now. Yeah, I would say, like, um, if a kid – a lot of the kids, they got to see themselves as brands also mm -hmm. and just try to promote themselves as much as possible. But I will also say, like, um, like, I don't know if you've seen what Justin Farley was doing this year. Like, he was like – had a graphic designer, like every game he was posting his stats. It was like, it was like, I mean, sometimes you just got to get creative. I mean, and what he was, he was on third team and he had led the, <laughs> led the seven, five, seven and scoring along with Jaden Epps. That, I mean, that's just crazy. But uh, I feel like, I feel like it's a great thing. I feel like it's a great thing. Yeah. I mean, and when you, when you get to talking about the teams and things like that, 
one of the things that I hear argued all the time is like, oh my God, what did his team do? How good was his team? We got to take that into consideration. And for me, I don't believe that postseason awards should be dealt that way. Mm -hmm. Because if you watch Nansman River, um, I mean, they weren't as good as, say, a Kings Fork team. And yeah, Jaden Epps and him scored the same amount of points. But I think if you take Jaden Epps off that team, Kings Fork is still better than Nansman River with Justin Fatherly. So when you look at him being third team and being first in the area in points per game, it just doesn't make any sense. The only argument you could probably make is, oh, well, his team wasn't, you know, didn't make a deep playoff run, but that's not exactly his fault. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he'll score as many points as he can. But I thought his graphics were awesome. <laughs> and when he told me it was his, his sister that did them, I was like, dude, your sister needs a job somewhere, man. Those yeah. were awesome. That's college. That's college level right there. She could be making money out of college right now. Yep, yep. Those were, those were awesome. And, I mean, it did kind of keep you up to him and be like, dang, man, he scored 38 again? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, I mean, I think he's a guy who did all that and did it pretty well. He didn't over, you know, sell himself or anything like that, but he let you know, hey, man, look at this cool graphic, and I scored 38 last night. <laughs> okay, got it, got it, Jesse. So, um, in your opinion, who's the best player right now in the 757? It's either one or two names. Are we including the 2020s? Yeah. I I would probably say Jaden and Jordan battle. Um, as far as how Jordan is, especially at the high school level, I thought he was absolutely fantastic this year. Um, I I am still completely shocked that he doesn't have more uh, opportunities to go play at the next level. I think that Jaden, with how young he is and how successful he was this year, um, I think that it, it's it's only going to get better. Mm -hmm. especially if he decides to stay. Um, so, I mean, I think that, that between the two, I think that those two had the best high school seasons this year. Uh, Justin Fatherly is in that conversation. Uh, I think, you know, Chance was, was really good this year over yeah. at Mansfield. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think there's quite a few players that you could possibly make an argument for, but I think that those two were, were top dogs this year. Yeah. Why, why do you think uh, – um, battle isn't getting the interest. Do you, is it because the public school? I mean, is it because that his private school situation? Because they don't play the best of people all the time, or or what? What do you think it is? I mean, it's a conversation I've had with a lot of coaches about him, and I mean that seems to be a um, something that's brought up a lot. Is that you know? Oh, is it because he doesn't play against the top competition? Is it because? Norfolk Collegiate doesn't play all these great schools. Um, and I could see that being a problem or being something about it. But then you watch him in the state semifinals in front of uh, 22, 25 Division I schools. He had 35 points, mm -hmm. outplayed um, – not didn't crazy outplay him because he played by Angelo Brizzy from Northern Virginia who just picked up offers from um, Villanova and Georgetown and has – all the mid-majors you can think of recruiting him. Uh, you know, he had like 32 or something like that. They went at it. But jo Jordan held his own against that guy. But Jordan, you know, and I had so many coaches from, from all these schools come up to me and be like, man, I knew he was good. I didn't know he was that good. But none of them have seemed to offer. <laughs> I think one of the things is, I mean, the first time I watched Jordan, I could see the talent. I could see the motor. I could see how hard he worked and how he understood the game. My biggest question with him was, like, when you were projecting him to the next level, what position is he? And I think that that's something that coaches do. Right now he plays on the basketball, and he makes great, great reads. He makes good decisions. He's almost unselfish to a fault on that team at times. Mm -hmm. But he would take it over when he needed to and, and could really score. Um, I think that a lot of coaches look at him and be like, well, you know, he plays on the ball now, but is he going to be a point guard at the next level? Um, is he going to be a two? Is he going to be a three? I consider him when I, when that argument I make is he's just a ball player. Yeah. Like he's a guy that you can plug and play in different positions. He can play multiple roles. He, he knows the game real well. He, uh, he's, he's just a, a very productive and good player. Um, but I think that a lot of people look at him and probably don't think he's as athletic as he is. I think that a lot of people watch him play maybe once or twice and don't think he can shoot the ball as well as he does. He's the type of guy that the more that you watch, the more you're going to like him. 
And I think that when you look at somebody like him, he really, really could have had a great April. And when coaches were still looking to fill roster spots in the next week or two, he's a guy that everybody would have gone to see. Mm -hmm. So I think that that hurts him. And then I think that, uh, like you said, the, the, the schedule, them being, you know, they weren't great his first two years and then they've come on. And I think that it's just one of those where not enough people have seen him or seen him enough. Yeah, they know what he how he's gonna play at the next level. Yeah, um, they were saying uh, his AAU team last year. He sh- he should have went somewhere else to play his AAU because he wasn't on the floor as much as possible during his last AAU season. I mean, yeah, it's it's one of those situations. We we all have this debate all the time. Is it better to be a backup on a on a shoe company team or is it better to be the man on a non shoe company team type situation? Um, but you could say the same thing. I mean, it was the same situation with Amir, Nez- or, or, Amir Nesbitt. Um, they both started on Boo. They both came off the bench. They were like the two main bench guys for Boo. Um, and then Amir split after the first couple of UIBL sessions, goes to play on the Adidas circuit with the ITPS Wildcats, and had a good summer. Yeah. He didn't get really recruited that much either. Okay. So I think it's a situation where – if he had played more and, and been more um, of an integral part of something, would he have been noticed more? Probably. But at the same time, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's so hard to tell kids that when Jordan had played for Loaded 757 and a couple other programs yeah. and, you know, in 16, you and, and didn't get noticed that much. So, you know, I think it's one of those he felt like he had to play on a shoe company. Uh, team. He played with Boo. Boo was really, really good, but Jordan wasn't a go-to guy on that team. So, yeah. you know, but I mean, even the Boo guys, even the guys I know who, who recruited him while he was there, I mean, everybody seems to be shocked that he has nothing or yeah. doesn't have much, but nobody is willing to pull the trigger on it. So, I think it's partially coaches not doing their job. I think that it's maybe the situation that he had, but uh, I mean, it, it just seems to baffle everybody, but nobody wants to change anything about it. So I think it's just kind of the nature of the beast that we deal with here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it will all play out in the best. But uh, he's definitely probably one of the most talented kids that come out of 757, and definitely in the 2020 class. Mm-hmm. I'd agree. Um, you know, especially after his senior year, I thought – I mean, I don't, I don't know if anybody in the senior class had as good of an overall year as he did. So – I mean, leading that team to the state semifinals, he had two great performances at Virginia State. Um, basically helped turn around that program that was so good when we were in high school but hadn't really been that, well, that good since, you know, Adam Grant and Bash Towns, you know, four or five years ago. So I think that his impact in the 757 is probably, over the past four years, has been probably as good as anybody's. Uh, who's on um- – Flip the script a little bit. Um, let's talk about, like, the 2020 class coming up. Uh, how good do you think they are going to be? Because, I mean, the it's so many of them. I mean, 2022, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those I, – I, I worry a little bit because I've been doing this for so long now, and I've seen it where it's like every class seems to be like, wow, man, this, this class is going to be really good. And then, you know, half the kids – don't reach what we expect. Half the kids don't grow the way that we were hoping they would. So I think I'm really cautious to talk about how good this class can be because I don't kind of want to overhype it as much as a lot of people have. But I will say, I mean, as far as the impact that a lot of these kids have had in their freshman and sophomore year, it's, it, it's something I haven't seen in a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they, the amount of kids that made all state teams this year, um, which is typically something that's held for juniors and seniors. But we've got sophomores winning player of the year, being first team all state. Uh, we got sophomores that have scored over a thousand points already. We got kids that are winning state championships as, as starting guards. And I think, you know, even, even when you look a little bit further down, you're seeing kids that maybe we didn't talk enough about that are starting to come on to it. Like Xavier Brown from Jamestown is one of those kids that, you know, you saw the potential when he was at Surrey and won a state championship as a freshman. And then this year you see the growth that he took was probably as much or better than any of the other guards in that area. I mean, 
he really came into his own. He helped turn around a Jamestown program, um, you know, that we all thought was going to have a down year this year. They actually were very competitive. Um, you know, I think a guy like him could come on and really surprise people. But I think the depth of the guards at, at the top are, are really, really good in the 757. I got like six or seven kids ranked in the top 20 um, that are just guards. Yeah. So I think – yeah, no, I think that it's it's as talented of a young class, and they've had ju- they've had probably a bigger impact than most have in their first two years. So I'm really intrigued to see how they get. But I mean, when when we mentioned a few of them, and you look at guys like Kenyon Giles, DJ Campbell, Kanye Clary, uh, Elijah White, Jay Neps, DJ Hand, then you go into other positions like George Beal, uh, Kenan Peebles from Hampton Christian really came on this year and had a really good year. Um, Greg Melvin over at Cape Henry. Um, you know, I think that it's it's going to be really good. And then you look at half of these kids can still probably reclassify. Yeah. So, you know, I've heard a few of the names being, being talked about by some of the boarding schools out West that they're trying to get to come over and, and reclassify. And, uh, you know, that, that I think will only add more stock to them. So, it's going to be interesting to see who stays, who leaves, um, who develops, who grows, things like that. But the talent pool is, is, is pretty deep, I think, right now. Mm-hmm. What, how, do, how does it work when you, um, like, write for someone or pick a kid to write about? Is it something someone gave you a hint, be like, hey, go check out this kid, or is it just something you see about a kid? Or have you ever – went to go see a kid and then you're like, yo, who is that though? Oh, all the time. I mean, it, it comes into, it, it's got a lot of things, but I mean, the, the, the first thing about it is what you mentioned first as well as the connections that you make. I mean, just like anything else, um, you build connections with people, especially somebody like me who has to go in such a big area. Um, I'm not going to be driving two hours to see a kid or to see a random basketball game hoping I find a kid. Somebody's got to tell me, do you know that I trust? Hey, man, I really got a player over here. We played against this kid, and he was really good, man. I think you should really take a look at him. Stuff like that is usually how I will find a new guy, or just people reaching out to me and sending me tape, um, sending me highlight films, stuff like that. Um, are all ways that I can start doing it. But all the time, I'll go to, you know, these these Saturday showcases during the high school season, or you go to an AAU event. And you go to watch this team that maybe has a kid or two that you know about. And then on the other team, you're just like, wait a minute, who is this kid? <laughs> um, and, you know, there's, there's so many times that, you know, you're in the back gym at an AAU event, not really expecting to see something. Maybe I'm looking for one of my Division three clients or something like that. And all of a sudden, here comes this kid out of nowhere on some no-name team that nobody knows anything about. That's what our goal especially is, is to find those type of kids. But – uh, so much of it has to do with relationships. So much of it has to do with doing your homework, um, finding different information, going to different events, um, and and just you know just doing your due diligence. I mean, so many times you talk about how college coaches don't exactly go out to find the diamond in the rough anymore, um, but I think that that's where guys like me really come into. Like we have, I have to get good information from somebody, then I have to be the reliable source. So I have to go check it out, then be the reliable source for my college coaches. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it's it's many ways to find them, but as far as writing about them on like prep hoops and stuff like that, uh, I think you earn it. You know, if I go there and you play well enough, whether or not I think you're a high major prospect or can maybe play. Uh, at a smaller level or whatever, even if I don't think that this kid's going to be a great player or can even play in college, you play well enough in front of me, you're going to get a write-up. Mm-hmm. Like, and so I try to take politics out of it as much as I can, um, especially when I'm covering live events and just, you know, find who played well, who did it in front of me, you get the write-up. That's pretty much how it is. Are there, are there politics in, in writing about a kid? Um, I mean, I don't really think that there's that much in writing about it. I think that there's, there's definitely been politics, especially in the AAU game where I'll go to an AAU coach and be like, Hey man, I need this and this kid. And they'll be like, yeah, can you also interview this kid, man? Cause you know, he didn't play that well today, but I need, I need him to feel like he's getting love and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, if, if I see potential and I see that they're maybe worth it. Yeah. But 
there's plenty of times I've also blown that off, take a picture of them, pretend to, to, to do something about it and be like, nah, man, I'm not going to do it because I got other kids that earned it. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's a, uh, I, I mean, I know that there's politics in it. I've been in the game too long to not know what the politics are. And, um, you know, I think that the longer I've been doing it, the less I'm really, um, per, like, swayed by them. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, there's always going to be stuff like that. I mean, I have to keep certain people happy. Um, guys who give me access to the best players, um, whether it's the big AAU programs, whether it's big time college programs, um, you know, like everybody, yeah, for, for a long time, everybody thought that I was super team loaded bias because I'm based in Richmond and this and that, but like, you know, Ty White is a guy that I've known and Ty has shown me love since day one. Ty will give me access to whatever event I need. He gives me access to the best players that come through his program. Um, he treats me like, like I'm big time, even though I know I'm not. You know, I'm the local guy, but, you know, if I need to talk to somebody and Paul being Cardi needs to talk to somebody, Ty going to let me get in there with him. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's one of those where um, you got to build the relationships, but I think I also, as time has gone on, it's, I know I'm not going to keep everybody happy. Um, so I tried my first year to play that. Oh, I want to be cool with everybody. I want to help out everybody. It's not, it, it just doesn't work like that. Um, there's always going to be somebody who thinks that you're sleeping on their kids or, um, you know, not showing enough love to this area or that area. It's just, it, it's always something that that's in the back of your mind, but you just got to kind of ignore it. I feel like, I, uh, I get the same, uh, kind of treatment. Like when oh, it's yeah, <laughs> when favoritism and you know like everybody think i'm like team push or team clay but i'm like when he was like when he was uh doing what was it chesapeake thunder aau team he was the only person that hit me up and was like hey yo come through whatever, whatever. and then as his program started to pro progress i mean he was showing love so i'm gonna show love back so every all the aau teams think like, I don't rock with them or something like that. But I'd be like, no, nah, that's not the case. Every time I do go to y'all establishment, I always get, you know, backlash or something like that. And that's why I always try to make it public. So I don't want people to think I'm, I'm not coming for a reason. Like, no, this is the reason that I'm not coming to your establishment or not coming to see your kid. You know what I mean? Because I don't know. I've been having – I don't know what it is about me, but <laughs> – they just don't want me on their baseline, and it, it's something. I don't know. And then I got to, like, show all my media passes of all the places I've been for them to – or I got to say something on Twitter and get a bunch of phone calls later from people I've never gave my phone number to. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's crazy, like, the uh, the King Sport situation. Yep. Man. Man, well, I, gotta, I mean, I got to say it, and I'm not <laughs> – to, to, to disrespect nobody or to area or nothing. But it seems to me like the 7-5 has so much more of, of these just like, like turf wars and, and situations where it's like you're either with us or you're against us and yeah. got all the AAU beef. And, you know, when did everyone become so sensitive about everything too, man? Twitter, like, Twitter fingers. Doug, it just got it's got to the point where it's like and then you gotta love the ones where they, they they hate on you and you know they hate on you but then they see you in person and they're like yo what's up man it's been a while no, no don't 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 do me like that mm -hmm. man. and it's been it's been too long in this if you don't like me that's cool i ain't gonna let it affect the way that i watch your kids i'm yeah. not gonna let it affect um whether or not i film you or, or write about you or uh anything like that but you know, I'm too old to be dealing with, with fake people. So just don't be fake to me. You don't like me, that's cool. Um, but that, that doesn't – I try to let that not affect the way that I act when it comes to the professional uh, side of everything. Like, I'm not going to affect whether or not I send your kids to, to different coaches or things like that. But uh, it definitely can get really annoying. And I feel like so – like, when I'm down there, I just, like, feel it. When I'm in a gym, I'm like, oh, man, this person's here and that person's here. They, I know they don't like each other. I've seen it on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, when, you, when you do come out here, do uh, other medias show you love because you uh, live in 804, even though you're a 757 kid? Uh, I mean, yeah. It, it, 
sometimes it gets to um like me getting into certain stuff will be tough that's why a lot of times i won't drive out for like one game Mm -hmm. uh even though you know it's an hour hour and a half depending on where i'm going in the 757 from where i live but so like i can shoot down there but it was like a few years ago when maury hosted the uh region a semis and it was the the back-to-back games um I couldn't get, I didn't, I, I don't like no plumber like that. I mean, I've, I've, I've ran into him a few times, but I don't know them like that. I show up to the gate. They're like, nah, man, you know, e- even though I had a pass, they were like, we don't know that pass. We don't know who you are. They're like, if you want to get in, call Matt Hatfield. And I was like, Matt's my guy. Like, I'll call Matt. I call Matt and Matt's like, I don't know what they're talking about, dude. Like, why did they throw my name in there? You know, so it's it's one of those situations where, like, when I go out for the Saturday events and stuff, I can usually reach out to a coach. Or if I'm going to a game where I know somebody, I reach out to the coach and make sure that I get on. But, you know, most of the people down there know who I am because I'm in there enough and I'm from there. So, like, you look at, like, Matt, you, um, Rubama, uh, Frank, um, Eric from from Green Run, even the little guy. Like I know, I know all them, and I've met them, and I try to be try to be cordial to everybody when I'm in the area. But um, it it definitely has gotten to the point where not everybody knows me. Mm-hmm. So once they he like a lot of them will be like, oh my god, yeah, follow me on Twitter or something like that. But uh, you know, as far as like it, I I know enough people to usually get by, and enough of the media usually shows me love. But most of the time, it's like you, Matt. Andrew, those are the guys that I talk to uh, the most. So, you know, when I see y'all, I get excited. But most of the other people, it's just kind of like, hey, what's up, you know. Um, but, like, out here, it's different. I'm, like, the celebrity out here. I, I go, not to be cocky, but, like, I go to a game in, the, in Richmond, and, you know, you know what it is. You walk in, and you got to dap up a 1,000 people because they all know who you are. Like, yeah. that, when I'm in the 7-5, it's almost cool because not a lot of people know me anymore. So it's like the coaches and the media people know me, but I don't got to million parents who uh know who i am but i gotta pretend you know you, you ever had that one mm-hmm. hey, hey day day and you're like who the hell yeah yeah what's up man good to see I, you <laughs> i think i think since i started like actually showing my face like doing this podcast like more people are starting to notice me and i think i'm like really bad at this but i feel like it's something that people aren't doing out here <laughs> i'm just doing it i'm just trying to do it uh constantly and you know i just do my best to try to put as much content out as possible on all levels. And I feel like that's what's making me stick out from a lot of media brands that's out here. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's also, I think that me and you have the niche of because we cover all the kids, mm-hmm. not just the big, big names, mm-hmm. um, not just the guys, maybe will get you the most clicks and, yeah, and yeah. Things, that's always great to, to cover those guys. But you know, when, when I started with prep hoops, they really made their model clear that, we give coverage to kids who deserve it, whether they're the big names, whether they're not, whether they're just get high school players, D3 kids, Juco kids, whatever. Like we give love to everybody. So I think that that has made, um, made me a favorite for a lot of people because I'm going to show unbiased love to people. It's also made people hate me because it's like, why are you showing that kid love and not my kid love? But, um, you know, I think that that also sets us apart and kind of makes us better in the local areas that we're in. Yeah. So you're not going to cover Julian Newman? No, 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 no. Uh, he's going overseas. I heard. I don't know exactly where he'll go. Mm-hmm. But, you know, my um, – Tav Hickman, my old coach, used to always tell me that I was the worst basketball player in North America. <laughs> if I went to New Zealand, I would be the worst basketball player there. Maybe he can go to New Zealand. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know what's going on with that kid. That'll be interesting. Um, on Twitter, you seem to have a, a beef with a media company or a person, and y'all like go back and forth all the time. <laughs> Why are you looking? Why your eyes get so big? Media <laughs> dude. <laughs> um, you and Jamar you always like disagree on a lot of He's guess, sporting sporting stuff. Do y'all still do y'all still uh disagree on a lot of stuff? Well he's blocked me now. Oh um, right. so yeah <laughs> not not really anymore. Um, 
you know, I'm I'm not gonna sit here and, and put the man down, but I mean, uh, you know, I think you know he he had some words about me on your podcast in the past. Um, I think that I was a little shocked by that because I didn't think we really had any problems, and that ever since that happened, it seemed to be, you know, I, I think that he thinks a lot of what I say is 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 toward him, and I think that it's toward the culture of it all right now. Um, you know, I think that anybody who really thinks that middle school basketball is that big a deal um, needs to kind of be taken down in a hutch. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's, you know. But uh, Jamal Brown is something to talk about. All right, man, I get it. I get it. Let's <laughs> talk about him when he gets to high school. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, You know, but, I mean, he seems happy over there coaching and good for him and, like I said, I'm not here to, to, to talk bad about anybody, but mm-hmm. yeah, there are certain people who uh, don't seem to have the same um, thought process about how we should go about things with with teenage kids and yeah. things like that. Um, I've been, you know, told by a lot of people that I seem like a grumpy old guy when it comes to my uh, <laughs> my thought process and all of this, but um, you know, I I'm just not I'm not a huge fan of of um, covering kids in middle school and things like that, because I think that that's how you end up with a situation like Julian Newman, mm-hmm. uh, where no matter what that kid did, he was going to disappoint because in fifth grade he had what he had. So let's, let's put it this way. When I played middle school ball, um, <laughs> probably the best player that I played against was your old teammate, Jared Jernigan. Uh-huh. Um, and Jared did something that I had never had done to me in an, competitive middle school basketball game when he pinned my shot like like it was you know like I picked up a loose ball and went to shoot a layup and he came with two hands and smacked it off the glass and I was like what what is going on here um Jared is a great player and a great kid Mm -hmm. uh started at Tallwood from from day one and had a great career there um and he went on to have a good career Barton Mm -hmm. but if we had been shooting highlight videos of Jared Jernigan since he was in sixth and seventh grade and then he went on to play at Barton, how would that really have looked for him on his career? Yeah. I think that a lot of people would have been like, oh, man, he was supposed to be the one, when, you know, it's just kind of how it is. Jared's a great player. Jared had a great career. Uh-huh. Uh, we had been filming him since seventh grade, and he didn't go to an ACC school. I think that would have looked a little bit, you know, yeah. it would have been a little disappointing. Okay. So that's why I'm not a huge fan of, of getting out and seeing these kids before they're – fully grown and fully developed. And I think in like ninth grade, you really see the cream rise to the top. Mm-hmm. Um, ninth and 10th grade is when you really start to see guys separate them and they, they, they grow into their bodies and, and mature physically. And, you know, that's sort of what happened with me. I stayed as a, a five, nine unathletic kid. <laughs> while Everybody else grew past me and, and, and started dunking and that was never in my cards. So, you know, I just, I kind of think that that's, that's where I really stand on kind of covering middle school basketball I don't blame you guys for doing it at all Jamal Brown is a freak for for his age and I watch his highlight tapes and I'm very impressed mm-hmm. but I'm gonna wait till he gets to high school to follow him yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got you I see what you're saying it definitely it definitely uh plays a toll you know kids are still very immature at the age and it's you don't want them to start playing for the highlights you want them to just play ball like play to win you know what I'm saying it's 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 already too many high school kids playing for highlights. Mm-hmm. That already that already irks me. And I think that that even goes into like when you're looking at how you want to develop your kids and and who you want your kids playing for at a young age. Like I don't believe like everybody seems to be in 15U. All these kids are like, yeah, man, I'm trying to get these offers up. That's not really how it happens unless you are elite elite kids, like nationally ranked Team USA basketball type stuff. Most kids at 15. 15U and stuff like that aren't getting offers. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's like, to me, it's more important for your kid to be somewhere where he's going to get developed, where he's going to mature, where he'll even, I'm I'm even a bigger fan of having them play up on like a non shoe company team than say having a reclass kid play 15U when he could be playing 16s. You know what I mean? Like I'm more of a fan at that age of kids getting better. And once 16 and 17, you hit, that's when you start to really, you know, have to look at, okay, where am I going to play that's going to give me the best opportunity to be seen in front of coaches? Where's the, where can I play that's going to give me the most media exposure, things like that. 
But as far as like young kids go, I, 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 I think we're like, it's almost like we're taking the fun out of it. If you're not getting recruited or you're not getting highlights or you're not getting write-ups, what's the point of playing basketball? It's like, that's not really what it is. We play it basketball definitely. because we love it. So. Uh-huh. It, 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 it's definitely, it's just the good and bad that comes with, I think, my type of media. There's so much good that can come from it. That's why I started showing full games or almost highlights of full games. But, uh, and I don't post as many um, IG mixtapes anymore because of, I feel like a lot of kids or people who expect me to, expect me to, uh, stay up with the bigger brands and it's like bro i'm one person they got 20 they got probably a person in every state covering kids probably five in one state you know what i'm saying but i definitely i definitely get what you're saying i think i think it's even it's it's just weird because those those like big big brands that post stuff and and i sit here and complain about them on twitter and how much i hate it and this and that but I'm going to run into it and I'm going to watch it. <laughs> it almost sucks. It's like when overtime puts up stuff that just, uh, I that can't watch so overtime no more. Cringe, but at the same time, do you know how many overtime videos I've watched? Mm-hmm. Not even on purpose. I'll just be scrolling through Twitter or Instagram and be like, Oh, what's this? Oh man, that's a dumb, that's a dumbass overtime video. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. but it's, it, I mean, it is what it is. Like, overtime employees close to like a hundred people mm-hmm. that go all over the place and they shoot with their phone. So you know, there, there's no overhead in what they do outside of travel. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think that um, I, I, to me, it's more of like a, uh, I, I, it's, it's kind of like a reputation type thing with me. Like, do I want my reputation to be one of those where I'll do anything to get the most subscribers, the most likes, the most clicks, yeah. things um, like that? Or am I going to keep my integrity and do what I think is right? And to me, it's, You know, when I first started doing this, I took it as like, oh my God, I got to get as many kids scholarships as I can. I got to get as many kids write-ups. I got to do this. I got to do that. And I I took a step back at one point and I was like, yo, like I was that person who was trying to tweet first without checking all my sources because I wanted to beat everybody because I wanted more people to see my tweet than the other guys. And 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 I had to take a step back where I was like, you know, I'm, this is high school. This is high school basketball I'm doing. All these people are treating it like it's the NBA or, you know, like big college. You're like, these are 16-year-old kids we're, we're dealing with, 17, 18-year-old kids we're dealing with. And, uh, you know, when you go to, like, it, it really changes it when you go to something like Top 100 and you watch the, the MBPA Top 100 and you try to interview a kid, you got, th- like, they'll bring kids out in waves, you know, so it'll be like four or five kids. So if I want to interview two kids, it's, it's almost impossible. Mm-hmm. because they're all getting interviewed in different parts. So as soon as I ask him, like, yo, can this kid stay for a couple of more minutes so I can interview him? No, nah, man, he's got to go. It's, yo, he's not in the NBA yet. Don't <laughs> kick me out of the locker room. You know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to talk to this 16-year-old kid to be like, yo, I like the game. Who's recruiting you? That's all I want to talk about. But, you know, they're like, no, nah, man, he's already been interviewed. You can't get him for the rest of the week. Like, all right, cool. That's not going to boost their egos or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. It's, to me, it's like an integrity thing. I'd rather um, I'd rather maybe have a smaller following, but be proud of what I do. Yeah, sell out to 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 be where some of these other guys are. I'm the same way. I, I think you know when uh, Sierra Cannon was playing at Richmond, so many people asked me to go and film that game, and I was like, "Is some seven five seven kid playing?" Like, I mean, I don't care. I don't care about getting the likes or views and stuff like that. I care about the kid that plays at uh, First Colonial. That you know what I'm saying, and he he's good too. You know I like him. Uh, I care about that kid going to school. I mean, he's LeBron's son. Of course he's gonna go to school. Like you you, I don't need to see a video on him. You know what I'm saying? And he probably and and to me he's not better than some seven five seven kids in this area right now. But because of who he is and the amount of clicks he's gonna get, everybody's gonna be there. Yeah, so when I went, I was really, really intrigued to see would it match um, what LaMelo and them had done at Virginia State the year before. Mm-hmm. Where I mean, but they didn't sell out Virginia State, but, I mean, it was me- – Media Row was crazy. There was so many people there. People were traveling two, three hours to come see it. 
I go to the Sierra Canyon game, and I'm like, is it really going to be like that at the Arthur Ashe Center? It was wild. <laughs> <laughs> it was like one of the craziest atmospheres I'd ever seen. I mean, there were people hawking tickets for $120 to watch a high school basketball game, man. Mm. They were letting – there was like 9,000 people in there. Trey Songs was in there. Like, it was just one of those situations where you're like, wow, like, is it really like this? And then you come to find out everyone's upset because LeBron wasn't there. LeBron had a game. <laughs> <laughs> what did y'all expect to really happen? Um, you know, but it's, it's one of those situations where like, I love, if it, especially if it's local, I'll go to an atmosphere like that. I'll go yeah. to it like that. Um, and I'm sure if Sierra Canyon had come down and played Kings Fork, you probably would have gone to that of course. game. Of course. But, you know, I mean, it all, it all is a little bit crazy, especially when you see something like that. I mean, Sierra Canyon was a really, really good team. Um, but it, it's like, they were going, they traveled more. I saw something where they traveled more than like any other college in in America for their games this year. They were literally hopping on flights and playing in the Mavs arena and playing in the in the Target Center in, in Minnesota and That's crazy. playing in, in high major facilities and it's like it's like wow man they were selling them out. Thirty thousand people coming to watch a high school game all because LeBron James son who didn't start and played about fifteen minutes of the game was on the <laughs> And then they're all upset when that – like, oh, man, he wasn't that good. He only played 15 minutes because they got four or five stars yeah. on the team, and he's a freshman. Like, it's, it's insane, man. I mean, they had kids moving across the country to play for Sierra Canyon. It's, it's really turned into, like, big business with teenage kids. It's, mm-hmm. it's gotten crazy. Yeah, that's why I say, man, high school kids, they got a brand name, like, brand themselves now. You know, they only – like a lot of the seven five kids, I kid, I guess they they don't they don't get it. Like when there's so many kids out here, like they post pictures with like firearms and stuff, and I'll be like, bro, what are you doing? And I and even after they're even after they're graduating and stuff, it's so many that I've seen like on the news or like I'm just like, yo, and I'll text Clay. Clay I mean, because Clay, you know, he's an AU coach. He's not in the school system. So I'll always hit him up and be like, bro, get this kid. Like, what is he doing? I'll text him like, bro, this, this just can't happen. Like, that, and that's why I feel like I try to do it. I try to expose, give the kids the most exposure possible to just try to do something new, man. Like, get out of here. Like, he, I mean, it's a lot of stuff to do here, but if this is going to trap you and make you do something stupid, you need to you need to go. Try to experience new things. And, and I don't think that, like, kids – and I get it because when I was 15 and 16, you couldn't tell me what to do and, and this and that. Back in the day when we had, like, MySpace, I was, play, I was posting all the wild stuff on that as well and um, things like that. But, I mean, it really is something that – the more it's grown, I think that the more kids really have to understand how serious this social media can be. It can, it can make or break you as far as like getting a scholarship, as far as just getting into a school, as far as getting a job moving forward. I mean, when you're, when you're applying for jobs, they're going to go through your stuff and go back four or five years and make sure that, you know, you're, you're not wiling out. I lost an internship to Murray state because um, they found my Twitter and at the time I was what, like 22. I had just graduated college mm-hmm. and my profile picture was me with at, at a table with, uh, my foot up on the table and there was an empty beer bottle next to it. And they said that that was too much, uh, that it didn't reflect the way that they wanted their, uh, employees at their university to be handling themselves on social media. So that was like my wake up call. And I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't a big deal. I wasn't going to be on camera. I was going to be working the camera. Yeah. And they were like, nah, man, we can't, we can't bring you out here and pay you to come do this and that. And I was like, wow. Like, you know, so that was like my big wake up call and it's helped me. And I know sometimes I put some stupid stuff on Twitter, but you know, I try to stay away from like using profanity, uh, anything that has to do with alcohol or anything that has to do with, um, you know, just, just basically stuff that, that'll make me look bad. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I have a life outside of this, but I try to keep, especially my Twitter stuff to just basketball. So that's why I try to explain to kids. I'm like, if you use Twitter correctly, you can make college coaches fall in love with you. You can make more people recognize you. You can use it to, as an avenue to reach out to people 
But so many kids at that age are more worried about looking cool, and I don't blame them. I wanted to look cool when I was that old, you know, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that I think not enough kids are really understanding how crazy that can be. Yeah, I feel like the coaches can help with that. but I feel like they need to, but then you look at half the coaches – <laughs> and they're arguing with each other about who plays for what AAU team and uh, team is better than which one. It's like, dang, man, what kind of what kind of what kind of example are we setting, really? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's somewhere coaches need to take a little bit more um, a little bit more responsibility and yeah. and uh, you know actually help teach these kids what they should be doing because you can tell them all day if they look on your Twitter and see you're not doing it. Uh huh. Well, how, how? Why would I listen to you? Yeah, I got you. Yeah, before before we get out of here, I wanted to ask you. Um, so during this Corona, I don't know how long it's gonna last. Uh, what What's your plans? Like, how how are you sticking to the game of basketball? What you been doing? <laughs> I'm going crazy, man. I'm losing my mind. Like, I feel like all of us that are in this business are used to ripping and running so much mm-hmm. and trying to get out. And we use this as our excuse to get out the house and be social and watch a lot of basketball. And we choose to do this because we don't want to sit inside all day and sit at desks and things. And yeah, it's been driving me nuts, man. But more than anything, I mean, I'm just trying to stay in contact with clients, maybe reach out to new college coaches. Um, you know, I'm running a special with my, um, with my service because a lot of the coaches I've talked to with the smaller schools, D2, D3, JUCOs, things like that, have all talked about how like their, their budgets have been completely frozen. They've, um, they've, they some schools have been furloughing different employees and putting them out of work for the summer because they can't afford to pay them. So like I've been, I've been talking to a lot of them. I'm running a, like a, a half off special for small schools. Um, for when everything gets better, because I know that all of them are going to have problems with their uh, budget. So a lot of it is just kind of, you know, reaching out to new people, trying to make connections with new people. Um, luckily, when all this happened, I had to redo my rankings already. I was already running behind on that. Okay. So uh, there's been a lot, of, a lot of good content on Prep Hoops Virginia w- regarding my updated rankings. I'm going to try to do a 2023 class rankings, but usually I wait till after the summer for that. So I'm not really sure how I'm going to do that. But, um, you know, it's been a lot of stuff. I've been encouraging coaches to send me film on kids that maybe I haven't seen, um, you know, and this is a shout to anybody in the 7-5 who wants me to maybe check out some of their kids, send it on over, DM me. You all have my Twitter, don't lie. Um, you Everybody know. has Jack Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most entertaining thing, bro. <laughs> bro, it ain't even like that, man. I'd be super professional uh, now. Nah, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's just trying to find new ways. I feel really, really bad for the kids. That's, that's the big thing about it. I am hating my life right now, but at the same time, um, I'm still lucky enough to have at least one of my jobs, and I've got to find a way to do that correctly. So, you know, um, I've been thinking about doing stuff like power rankings for different areas, like ranking the prospects, top 30 prospects, regardless of class, uh, in the 757, you know, in the 804 and, and stuff like that. So I think it's just trying to find new, um, new ways of just, you know, keeping people entertained and trying to keep basketball in your life. And I can only watch so many of these old games that's being put on the ESPN, though, man. I, no, I- I've been posting the old games, too, but it's been games, like, when I first started recording. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But you got to get creative, man. Man, you got to go back. We got to hit up Taft and see if you can make more Denzel Bowles highlights or something like that. I got – you know, I got – you know, I got the game when we played y'all and uh, uh, y'all took that L. Oh, man. What was it? (laughs) Overtime, right? Wasn't it an overtime? Oh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, Zell went for like 39 that game or yeah. something. And y'all he still did. beat us. He did, but y'all took an F. So, you know, that's uh, all that matters. But I was actually seeing that. Was it Was it you that posted the thing or somebody posted something about uh the 2000s? The yeah, 2000- that was me. That was me. Uh-huh. No, no, 2006. 2016. Yeah, our coach at the time, man, man he he recorded every game. So he, uh, yeah. he got, made us a DVD and he gave it 
to uh, all of everybody on the team, but I'm the only one that still got the DVD. So yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to post that. And uh, I was surprised at the many views it got, though. They were good that year, man. Yeah, you see, so good. <laughs> there, were, there, were, there were plays where the ball didn't touch the ground. Like, mm -hmm. it, it was just crazy. That was, that was just different. And, and we won't play no chumps. I was trying to tell them, like, we playing Duke Cruz, Percy Harvin. Um, well, what was the dude uh, that played at Franklin County? He went to Virginia Tech. Uh, I forgot his name, uh, but we played Maury. The Maury that had, that was a state championship team that Maury had with uh with um Cam and um uh yeah. Brandon Plummer and uh, Miles Holly. Like it was yeah. it was tough, and we was. Well, I was I was talking with D Nice about uh you know about midway through the season about everything going on and. And he was talking, and, and I was like, you know what you should do, man? I was like, you should show him a tape of when we played Booker T in the uh, regional quarterfinals my sophomore year when we had Denzel and Davon in bracket, and they had um, Miles Holly, Deshaun Painter, uh, Desley, uh, Lil Norfleet. They, and, and I was like, just show him that game to show him not only that, one, Kempsville was good at some point, yeah. and two – to show them the amount of talent that, that, that like, was on the floor at that point in time. Like, I feel like these kids at Kempsville and even some of the kids in the 757 don't realize how naturally gifted those kids were back in that day. I mean, there are some plays from that game that I still just randomly think about. And I'm like, man, I haven't seen anything like that in years. But now these kids all think, like, oh, man, people are built different nowadays. It's not – no, there's always been athletic kids. There's always been great basketball players. We just – good luck finding the tape from that game. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's just totally different now in the exposure. But, um, yeah, man, like, thinking back to that, especially the heyday in the Beach District, we were – it was it was a battle every day. You had to play each team twice. I know. 18 24 games, games <laughs> with the same people that you played for four years, and you literally started to hate everybody. Mm -hmm. matter if you went to school with him, I'd see him outside of the gym. Hey, what's up, Jern? What's up, Byron? You know, those are my boys. But step on the court, I don't, I don't like none of y'all. Like, yeah, yeah, that was a fact. We had to see each other. And then you play summer league, so we saw each other again another three times. And then when, when school wasn't in, we was at the rec. Yeah. Like, against each other. At City <laughs> League, man. Yeah. After it. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy, though. Know? But a lot of the kids now, they don't, they don't care what came before them. No. Don't matter. And, and, and with, the, with the way AAU was, like, so many of us didn't really play AAU because it was only so many teams to play for. Now it's like everybody plays for all the AAU teams. Every so, right team is an AAU team, man. Yeah. So now everybody's boys, too. Like, you know, it doesn't matter if you play at this school and I play at that school. We're all boys. So, you know, let, let, let's all go to Waffle House after this.